International Relations, Podcast Lecture Number 3, Game Theory. Game Theory is not a theory of international politics. It does not, like liberalism or realism, make claims about how international pol political actors interact, what kind of puzzles they have, etc. It does not make any claims about the world, what the world is made of. And in fact, actually, it's not even a political uh, theory to begin with. Uh, as we will see, it emerges out of economics and can be applied to a large range of fields of human interaction. Game theory is much more of a method that allows us, allows us to study and calculate the behavior of actors in certain kind of settings. It does have one very strong assumption about those actors, that they are rational. This implies that whatever kind of actor you want, whether it's a state, an institution, an organization, a group of people, or an individual, As an actor, it will have a certain preference, a certain goal, something it wants, and will be weighing all decisions very careful in terms of costs and benefits to decide upon the option that brings him or her closest to the preference that they have. In other words, we carefully calculate our each and every move in terms of where we want to be. By assuming those basic uh, decision-making traits, game theory can calculate the outcomes of political decisions. Game theory originates by three processes coming together. First of all, the, the, the mathematical term that economics took in the late 1930s, in which um, mathematics became the prime language for economic analysis, which spurred a whole range of new models of human decision making all about the predicting of behavior of human actors. This was combined in the 1940s and 50s with the growth of computers. The mathematical models that were developed by economists could easily become very complex and very difficult to calculate. However, the new invention the computer was able to calculate much larger numbers of variables than humans were ever able to do. And therefore, we were able to calculate much more complex models of decision making. And for the field of international relations, this combination between behavioral models and computer power became particularly important in the context of the Cold War. The Cold War was a conflict in which there was very little knowledge of what was going on on the other side. Policy makers in the United States, for instance, had very, very little insights into what was actually going on in the Kremlin and what kind of decisions were being made there. In order to get a grip of the situation and particularly the nuclear arms race and the potential for mutually assured destruction, there was a huge demand for predictive data, for predictions on how the Soviets would respond to certain moves. And this was exactly that the economic modeling plus the computing power of the new computers were able to do through game theory. 
like I said before, game theory itself does not take sides very much in um, international relations theories. However, initially it seemed as if it was very much on the realist camp. This was because of the way in which game theory produces outcomes that are contrary to collective rationality. Centrally, the idea is that for, co for, for the group of actors to cooperate may be the rational choice, but for each individual actor it may be much more attractive to actually cheat and not cooperate. This was hardly a new insight. Already in the 18th century, Jean-Jacques Rousseau had articulated this thought in his famous allegory of the stag hunt, in which a group of men start hunting a stag in order to provide for the families. But stag hunts are difficult and can take a lot of time, uh, usually several days. So one of the men, while guarding the trap for the, for the stag, uh, sees a hare running and makes the following calculation. If I stay here and help with hunting the stag, I might be one or two days without food. Having caught a stag, of course, will provide me with several days of food, but it will take me long to get that food for my family. If I take, if I hunt and take this hare right now, I will have food for my family tonight and I'll see tomorrow what I'll do. The only downside is that with me leaving my post the hair, the, the stag will actually get away and not be caught at all. So the others will be left with nothing. And Rousseau showed that it's in the individual interest of this hunter to actually go for the hare and forfeit the hunt of the stag, even though it is at the group's collective interest to go for the stag and for feed the hare. Well, in this line of thinking there have been several forms of uh, games that have been developed. Um, chicken game, uh, coordination games, assurance games. All are basically uh, roughly based on the idea that collectively we have an interest in cooperation, but individually we actually have a very strong inclination to cheat, not because we're just damn cheaters, but rather because cheating actually is the rational thing to do. This thought has most prominently been put forward in uh, the famous Prisoner's Dilemma. I'm not going to explain the original story here, you can look it up on Wikipedia. Um, but basically what the Prisoner's Dilemma shows is that while multiple, well, two actors may have one shared outcome as their shared interest, it is their individual interest to do something quite different. So let's see how this works. This one is taken from the Cold War, in which the USSR and the USA are in an arms race, a nuclear arms race. Right? Both of them have a choice to either arm build more nuclear arms or disarm. And their preferences are indicated with the numbers between the brackets. So you see that for both of them um, the uh, preference for disarming is relatively high as long as the other is disarming as well. It's a four on both sides making the total preference eight points. Right. Um, the lowest shared interest is if both of them arm. Both of them only have two points of preference in armament and therefore only a total of four. In the case of one actor arming and the other disarming, there is a very clear uh, difference in preference. 
if I am in a situation where you disarm and I actually arm, my relative gains towards you are going to be such that I am going to be very powerful and that is a high, highly preferential to me. Simultaneously, I don't want to be in that situation myself. I would be extremely uh, unhappy to find that I have dis disarmed while you have armed. So how does this work out? Well, this prisoner's dilemma box clearly shows that the highest utility goes for the box disarm, disarm, where both actors actually disarm uh, and do not arm. But what do they actually do? Well, let's take the position of the United States and see how this works out. If I, as the United States, have to decide whether I'll arm or disarm, I'll just go over the scenarios. Let's assume that Russia, that the Uni Soviet Union, disarms. What would be wisest for me to do? Well, if I disarm, I'll be really happy because we have reached both of our preferences. Disarm, disarm. Eight points. But if the Soviet Union disarms and I arm, I'm also really happy because I've gained a relative power position vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union. And what happens if the Soviet Union arms? Well, that's pretty clear. If the Soviet Union arms and I disarmed I am really screwed. I really do not want that situation. And if I arm while the Soviet Union arms, we may not have our mutually preferred outcome, but we've got a stable situation that we can live with. So this means that in the scenario of the Soviet Union disarming I will be happy with both options, although my preference would probably lie with arming because then I would get a relative power over the Soviet Union. But if the Soviet Union would end up arming, my preference would very, very strongly lie with arming because disarming would be a disastrous outcome for me. And as a consequence, in both scenarios, I have a rational incentive to arm. We can assume that for the Soviet Union exactly the same logic would apply and this means that while both the Soviet Union and the United States together collectively have a very strong interest in disarming, it is rational for both of them to actually arm. And the outcome will be arm arm. This kind of realist game theoretical analysis was very prevalent in the 1960s and 70s. But in the 1980s, liberal thinkers started appropriating game theory to show that this is not necessarily the only possible outcome um, in game theoretical modeling. Axelrod in his Evolution of Cooperation showed um, how game theory can actually lead to very stable cooperative outcomes, particularly if it's stretched out over a longer period of time in which you have more uh, moments in which different actors can communicate, which in game theory are called usually rounds. And Axelrod showed this by making use of historical evidence from World War I, where the soldiers were fighting in the trenches, particularly the Germans on one side and the French and British on the other side, uh, were able to develop highly stable forms of cooperation without even being able to communicate by words. Right? Um, for instance, when you're a soldier in a trench, um, and you have only one decent meal a day, which would be at sunset. 
then you have a very strong interest not to have that meal ruined by an enemy attack. One of the patterns that emerged in World War I was exactly that both parties stopped attacking one another during dinner time. And um, pushing that even further, um, both parties stopped attacking each other's food supplies when they would arrive. This was never officially communicated, they wouldn't speak, uh, they wouldn't real have a complex flag system or something, but it was rather based on um, experience. right? Um, namely, if you would attack the other side's food supplies, which both of the sides could easily do, you would soon learn that the others would retaliate. And do the same for you and you would end up in a miserable situation the same would go for attacking uh, one another during dinner time or for instance attacking one another when uh, retrieving the wounded and dead soldiers from the battlefield so in this hostile competitive surrounding both parties were able to learn from interaction to cooperate because they were punished or rewarded for their behavior. This was made theoretically clear by introducing the idea of reiterated games. Whereas a uh, prisoner's dilemma is just a one-shot game. You decide either to arm or disarm, in the case of long-standing conflicts such as the trench wars, um, we could uh, rather see a number of rounds taking place within one game. And it became a reiterated game. And this multiplicity of rounds allows for learning on both sides. So this idea of reiterated games allows for stable cooperative outcomes. And this has been put forward most radically by uh, um, Rappaport, who in the 1980s developed the tit-for-tat game, which was a computer simulation that showed that even if you have a hostile relation with someone else, you can actually coerce that person or that actor into cooperative behavior over time. Simply by copying that person's behavior in the next round. So roughly, if my enemy uh, starts cheating on me or starts uh, stops cooperation, I am going to cheat him. If he then turns back and starts cooperating again, I immediately follow up and cooperate again. Keep this up long enough the tit for tat model shows and actually the other side will see that it's going to be more profitable and more reliable to actually cooperate and the end will be a relatively stable cooperation scheme so in this way game theory has actually also supported liberal cooperation theories There have been, however, a lot of critique of game theory. Um, there is, and I mentioned this also in the last podcast on liberalism, a whole discussion on, well, actually, do states make rational decisions? How, how would that work? Um, and these questions sort of point towards the fact that maybe states may actually not make decisions at all for a whole range of issues or actually make decisions on the basis of emotional or hysterical understandings of complex realities right discourses of fear so to say um, or that states actually have very limited access to information um, that have very very skewed understandings of the choices that they have, etc., etc. Another critique of game theory has to do with um, 
are mutually understanding of the situation. The example of armament and disarmament in the prisoner's dilemma assumes that both the United States and the USSR are aware of what exactly is at stake and what the game is. In international relations that's not always obvious. There can be many situations in which different actors seem to be playing different games with different stakes um, and not actually be on the same page at all. For instance, when um, the, the relations between the United States and Iran were at a historical low in the early 1980s after the Iranian Revolution and the uh, um, uh, hostage crisis, the United States tried to coerce Iran by threatening to bomb Iranian, uh, Iran's oil fields. But they were completely oblivious of the fact that for Iran, uh, Iran itself, which has moved from a welfare state towards a theocracy, the oil fields had become largely irrelevant. It wasn't Khomeini's um, uh, project at all to maximize economic revenues for his country. He was playing a completely different game. So the threats that un the United States made towards Iran were completely useless. Another set of critique comes with this idea of reiterated games, in which we have new rounds that help us to stabilize cooperation. However, the idea of rounds and games are, of course, abstractions. When in practice would you know that a new round has actually started? And even if you would know that a new round of decision making has started, how would you know that it's actually not a completely new game to begin with? The differences would be huge because if you have different rounds within a game, they will help you cooperate. But if the game has changed from one game to the other, uh, you might actually want to apply quite different logics there. And the final set of critiques um, geared towards game theory is that it may be a very predictive theory that can be very dangerous to use in policy advice, which is actually the way it has been used quite extensively, particularly in the case of the United States and the arms race. Um, what would happen if both sides of the conflict would use the prisoner's dilemma for formulating policy? Right. What you would have then basically is a model of behavior that actually becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So it would actually push states towards armament, etc. And therefore become part of the political game instead of just a tool for policy analysis. After the Cold War we saw a very sharp decline in game theory, usually mostly because we started seeing that the world had become so much more complex with so many more new kinds of actors that the models very rapidly became really really complicated. Right, where a, a prisoner's dilemma only has two actors and two choices. Uh, in the cases of a globalized economy, uh, the globalized world and a multipolar system, things are really really much more complex. However, in recent times you see a modest but uh, substantial um, new interest in game theory by certain IR scholars who are making advantages of the fact that our new generations of computers can calculate so much more than those in the 1980s and early 1990s. And for instance, Bruce Bueno de Mesquita, uh, he uses a multi-actor models that include up to a hundred different actors with all of them with different preferences and ways of ballot weighing choices etc uh, for calculating political outcomes and uh, 
even tries to actually predict the future of political um, conflicts on the basis of this kind of analysis. Okay, some final questions to end this podcast with. Game theory transforms complex social and political relations into very simple games. One of the questions that arises then is, what does it actually have to leave out in order to be able to model reality? What do we lose when transforming a political decision-making process or a political set of interactions into a two-by-two reiterated game? What are the dimensions of politics that we actually are losing here. Secondly, can game theory actually predict? Are its assumptions so close to reality that the outcomes that the model gives actually fit reality close enough? And finally, if game theory supports both liberalism and realism, what does that imply? What does that help us understand if, uh, of the world if it's a similar model giving us contradictory answers? <laughs>